Welcome back to this research on 18th century tack. Having covered a general history of bridles in the 18th century, I'll do a further analysis into the use and application of bits in the 1700s. The bit, of course, is that metal bar that applies to a bridle, and it's very much a necessary tool that every horseman used. If you weren't using a bitless bridle, you had to pick the right bit for your horse. In the last video, I mentioned there were roughly two kinds of bits that were widely used back then. Well, the 1700s was only 300 years ago, so it does remain relatively the same today. So let's dissect and elaborate more on these different types. A snaffle is defined as the bit that uses direct pressure on the corner of the horse's mouth. Now, this is also handy because if we look at period plates and drawings, we see this type of bridle was used often. This type of bit is good for lateral movements, lateral movements with the horse to go to the right or to the left. For this reason, a snaffle bit is perfect for lateral flexions, moving laterally to the right or to the left. Anything that requires the rider to pick up one rein at a time that connects directly to the mouthpiece is a snaffle. So for going right or left or using lateral flexion, anything that requires you to pick up one rein at a time, that is what a snaffle is good for. It connects directly to the horse's mouthpiece and uses direct pressure also on the bars of the mouth. That's an area of the horse's mouth on the gums where the bit naturally rests. There's no teeth there, so it's a natural place for the bit to go in. If we look at this contemporary image, it's depicting the Allied march through Williamsburg after the victory at the Battle of Yorktown. The riders, who in this case are George Washington, Lafayette, and Russian Bow. These bridles are applying direct pressure via the reins from the hands directly to the horse's cheeks and mouthpiece. So what makes a snaffle is that direct pressure from the rider's hands through the reins all the way to the horse's mouthpiece. We see George Washington in 1765 ordering a snaffle bridle from England. He was 27 at the time and purchased this equestrian gear 
with tobacco that he had grown on his estate. He purchased another snaffle in 1760, and we have records that he continued to purchase snaffle bridles throughout the rest of his life. Now a horse can argue with a snaffle bit a little bit more easily than they can with a curb bit, because a curb bit applies much more pressure. Unlike a snaffle, where the reins attach at the level of the mouthpiece, the curb bit is accessed using vertical pressure. It's vertical pressure because the reins on a curb bit attach below the horse's chin. This allows the horse to have vertical flexion. Now this bit uses leverage instead of direct pressure, like the snaffle bit. this reason, it's called a leverage bit, which means that when the rider applies, say, five pounds of pressure on the reins, the horse will feel more than five pounds in his mouth. It may also feel 10, 15, 20 pounds more of pressure, depending on the length and shape of the bit. A curb bit is sometimes also called a shank bit. Well, it affects four more areas of the horse's head than does the snaffle bit. When the reins pull, it applies pressure on the bars of the horse's mouth, his cheeks, his tongue, but also the roof of his mouth, his jaw, his pole, and the groove behind the chin. Because with a curb bit, there's also a chin strap involved. Because they feel the chin strap, whether you pick up the right rein or the left rein, they feel it evenly across the bottom of their jaw, and this helps them tip their nose into it. This also allows the rider to ask for vertical flexion. Because of the extra pressure that this gives the horse, it's an ideal bit for offering gentle cues through the reins. For this reason, I think that's why it was so popular in the 1700s with masters such as William Candish. In fact, in his manuscript, I only see him using curb bits. Well, the reason for this is a simple one. When advancing a horse from a snaffle to a curb bit, the horse must be educated to the new areas of pressure that will be applied, so he does not overreact and hurt himself or his rider. But when used properly, it can be an excellent way to direct the horse with very little pressure. This bit is also used to assist in restricting a horse's forward motion. Like I said before, it can be a good way to halt the horse with less pressure. And it also helps collect and set the horse on his haunches. That's vertical flexion. This was a highly sought after skill by early dressage artists of the 1700s. Artists like William Candish. He actually suggested starting young horses on a curb bit first, as their first bit. Here we see an image of one that he claims to have designed himself, and he was suggesting it to the King of France in his manuscript. Mostly in contemporary times, 
Curb bits are used on horses that are more advanced in their training rather than on young horses, but done correctly, it can be very effective. And more importantly, for the 18th century, these bridles were meant to be ridden one-handed. So a soldier can hold the reins in one hand and his saber, pistol, or lance in the other. For this reason, it was very effective for the military. You see curb bits in most every military painting of the 1700s that involve cavalry. And we understand why many cavalrymen preferred these bridles, since their very lives depended on total control of their mounts. Well, it also helps that they had both a snaffle and a curb bit at their disposal so they can access and utilize all parts of the horse's skull and his brain and pressure points to their advantage. Fair and well, since after all, not only the rider's life depended on the ride control, but also the horse's life depended on it. And in every other day riding, some horsemen, especially the more advanced one, did prefer to use the curb bit, if not the snaffle.